Hi, everybody. Nicholas Thomas here. I just finished recording a great episode of The Hospitality Spirit with Deep Road Ja from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. During our conversation, we covered a wide range of topics, including how we got involved in hospitality education, innovative teaching strategies, and the role study abroad plays in preparing students for their careers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. All right. Good morning, everybody. Dr. Nicholas Thomas here recording live at the Corner Estate in Jackson with the Hospitality Spirit. I'm so happy you're joining us today. I am so pleased to be joined with Deepro Ja, Associate Professor of the Practice and Director of Global Engagement for the Hospitality Restaurant and Tourism Management Program at University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Deepro, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Nick. I'm so excited that you're here. You you made it even with some weather delays. This is this is becoming a theme when we try to record a podcast in the wintertime in Chicago, weather delays. Yes, it's fun, fun winter travel. <laughs> so you are visiting Chicago. You're, uh, you are Associate Professor of the Practice at University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and you're actually on what we call in the academic world a sabbatical uh, from University of Nebraska-Lincoln. You're on sabbatical from uh, January to June. Um, for those that aren't uh, familiar with the, the nomenclature we use in, in the academy, what does that mean on sabbatical? Sabbatical basically means it's a professional development leave. Um, to basically, you take this time out to uh, learn new things, enrich yourselves, and then come back uh, re-energized, uh, re-nourished, and then give back to the university and the work you are doing. So it's a great privilege that we have as academics to take this time out and invest completely in ourselves to make us better, both personally and professionally. So it's a fantastic opportunity. So it's not a vacation. Oh, it's but not. It's not a vacation. <laughs> no. It's definitely so. You're so you're basically you are uh, stepping away from your uh, from your teaching duties, uh, your your responsibilities on campus, and you are uh, going around to uh, different universities. You happen to be here in Chicago, and you're spending some time at uh, DePaul University in the School of Hospitality Leadership. And you're uh, from here, and you have been at other universities around the U.S. Um, what what is the what's the focus of your sabbatical? What are you looking at uh, as you're visiting these hospitality programs? Uh, one of the things I'm trying to learn, Nick, is that what are the best practices uh, for the other programs, like y- your uh, program at the School of Hospitality Leadership at Deep Hall, is absolutely incredible. What are some of the things that um, we can learn from you and I um, as an instructor? can also uh, learn in terms of um, delivery of programs, delivery of teaching, and all of those kinds of things. So I am doing similar visits to other schools like um, Kansas State, to University of Denver, um, San Diego State, and my goal is to basically like a sponge soak up all of this knowledge and wisdom from leaders like you. Well, we appreciate you visiting us here. I think that's... um what I really find interesting about the the hospitality academy, and when I say academy, basically the the field in which we deliver education, um, the the education landscape, is while there's a lot of similarities, there's also a lot of differences amongst these programs. So I think that's kind of neat that you're going around and figuring out what what makes us different, but also what what kind of areas we have in common. Um, so you are the associate professor of the practice, but you're also director of global engagement uh, for the Hospitality Restaurant and Tourism Management Program. Director of global engagement, what, is, what does that entail? What is that? I mean, I, I know you love to travel and, the, and you believe in your uh, um, true, your, your passion is travel and international experiences. What is kind of director of global engagement? What does that entail at, in your uh, current? Mm, sure. You know, the philosophical context of global engagement is that um, hospitality is a global discipline. We are highly interconnected. And one of the things that uh, we know that our students need to develop global competencies, which is extremely important. So they may be working somewhere, probably in a small town in the United States, uh, but they may be engaging with people who are coming from all over the world. Do they have things like the the emotional intelligence, the intercultural competence to be able to do that. So in my role as director of global engagement, um, I try to create 
of learning opportunities for our students to be able um, to do that. And so it may be creating study abroad programs, it may be creating other experiential learning opportunities, or even uh, using technology to bring the world into the classroom. So all of that entails my, uh, my role as director of global engagement. I'm curious, you and I have known each other for a long time and we've never had a conversation like this, but I'm interested, how did you, how did you get involved in education? What, what, was the, what was the spark? I think for each of us it's different and I'm always fascinated to talk to educators. What was the, what was the, the, the spark, I guess, that got you into education? Sure, um, you know, I, I, once I graduated college, um, I worked in the hotel industry for a long time, and then um, I decided that I will um, come back and get a graduate degree. And when I was in graduate school, I suddenly realized this is fun. I love learning, and then I also quickly realized I also enjoy teaching and mentoring. So that led me to the path of getting more education and then, of course, um, I started teaching, and I absolutely loved it. And here we are. What sort of classes do you teach at University of Nebraska? Thank you. My primary expertise is in um, lodging and guest services. So I teach uh, the lodging courses at University of Nebraska, also guest services management. I also teach an online course in hospitality law. Mm -hmm. So it's a bouquet of courses. What are some of the... I've always like, enjoy following you on social media, and we'll put your social media links uh, in your bio here on the, uh, in the podcast description. I always enjoy following you because you seem to go to some amazing places. But um, what I also see when I, when I follow you on social media, some of the innovative things that you're doing in the classroom uh, in terms of creating really interesting, unique experiences for your students. Um, I think you're a true believer that innovation – exists in the hospitality industry uh, in lots of different ways to enhance the customer experience, to make the employee experience better. Uh, but I think you're also a believer that innovation can occur in the classroom to make the learning experience better for students. What are some of the things that you're doing in the classroom right now that are really innovative and exciting? Sure. And, and thanks for the comment, Nick. Um, you and I both know that the, uh, that the discipline of hospitality and hospitality education is undergoing dramatic changes and so we need to be um, innovative as educators to be able to keep up uh, with the real world. So uh, one of the projects that I am very excited about and that I have been doing launched last year is the Global Virtual Classroom. And, uh, and what we are doing in the Global Virtual Classroom is that um, I connected with two institutions in the Middle East, uh, one in Oman and one in the United Arab Emirates, and then I took my introduction to the lodging course and basically connected uh, through live synchronous exchanges through Zoom to these campuses. And so I called it three countries, one classroom. So basically we have students and faculty from these three different countries, diverse cultures coming together and learning together. And we had some incredibly powerful learning moments, for example, uh, when we did the assessment, we found out that many of our students in Nebraska who had no idea if, that these countries existed or their culture are now much more interested in traveling abroad, in learning about other cultures. And it goes back to the comment I made earlier about global engagement, global competencies, that once again, we are a global industry. How do we expose our students to some of these global themes and help them develop those, those competencies, because as much as we want, we know everybody cannot travel or, or, or Donna doesn't have the means or wherewithal and all of that stuff. So once again, uh, I mean, using this very innovative approach and using the power of technology to bring the world into the classroom and, and, and making the students from all of these three diverse campuses kind of see um, that, um, that they are, they're very similar in what they think, what they aspire, what they want to do, and that's fantastic. So which, and you said you put this in your lodging operations class? Yes, um, this is into my introduction to lodging. And I chose the introduction to lodging because most of the students there are um, probably freshmen and sophomores. They have, uh, they have lesser experience or exposure. So it's a, it's a great way, um, essentially, 
um, to get uh, the students who are more fresh into the program to get started. Do you find that it was difficult to teach anything really related to lodging operations? That at the end of the day, the, it was really about just teaching intercultural communications, soft skills more than anything else? I mean, could, could, the, could the concept have worked in any course, essentially? Um, I, I think so. Um, uh, basically, I, I see that see the concept could work mainly in any of the operations related course whether it's lodging food and beverage and so on and so forth um, and and given the regions of the world we are connecting to um, we had a lot of fun because as you know Dubai has the most luxurious hotel in the world Burj Al Arab and then so on and so forth so um, and what I had my students also do is the Nebraska students did the presentation on the lodging industry in Nebraska, and it's kind of funny that I, uh, when we were rehearsing the presentations, I told them, let's talk about the bed and breakfast industry in Nebraska, because Dubai is going to probably blow us out of the water <laughs> with, with their hotels and so on and so forth. So uh, each of these locations spoke to their strengths, and, and using that peer teaching model of students from each campuses or each location, teaching their peers about the lodging and the hospitality industry um, in in those locations that also brought out a lot of pride. So when we when we talk about uh, you know how do we deliver transformative learning, I could see that this was much more than just an lodging operations class. It's interesting because I've I've done similar projects in my in collaborative learning experiences. We we call them GLEs here, global learning experiences. They go by lots of different names. I mean, there's uh, COIL, C-O-I-L, Collaborative Online, International Learning. I mean, there's, in the research, you see lots of different areas. We we happen to call them GLEs here. Um, and I've done the same concept in um, a leadership class. I've done it in an introduction to hospitality class. Um, and what I've kind of found is it almost doesn't matter the subject that you put it in. The The, the subject that you put it in is more just the the context by which you're delivering it, that the, it, the, it almost becomes an organizational behavior, like how to work effectively in teams and um, how to work with somebody who doesn't have the same communication skills as you do and learning about diversity and learning about project management. I mean, it, that's, it, it starts, the, the other skills that you start to learn about and, and, be, and enhanced, and we talk about Hofstede and cultural communication, and that's what it ends up becoming. And I just usually will tie it to an assignment related to that particular subject that we're learning about. But the times that I've done it, it's been a great, um, it's been a great addition to the course, and I think I'm going to continue to do it, and I encourage my colleagues here to do them, do them as well. So you did it with Oman. Uh, you did it with, uh, it sounds like Dubai, yeah. which was the, the, the emirate that you decided to do it with. But you did it synchronously as opposed to asynchronously. So the lectures were occurring live. That, that is correct. And, and because uh, we did synchronous sessions, um, it was fraught with lots of challenges. Uh, first of all, we are talking about a nine-hour time difference. And since this was a fall class on November 4th, when you know, DST happened, then we had to basically request our partners in the Middle East to push back their classes by one hour. So once again, you have done this many times, Nick, you know, that uh, these kinds of projects, they deliver incredible learning, but they're also a lot of work um, to manage, to coordinate logistics. But if you have the personal relationships with people, um, and they, they will believe in what you are trying to do, and they will participate. And, and, and you mentioned that you, you, you are continuing that. Actually, what has happened is uh, because of the success of the three countries, one classroom, I started getting a lot of interest from other institutions. So hopefully this fall when I teach the class, we will actually ramp it up to six countries, one classroom, because... I now have interest from schools in the United Kingdom, in the Netherlands, and in the Ukraine. So we will have United States, Europe, and the Middle East. So basically a six-hour and a nine-hour time difference, all basically participating 
in a live conversation. You need to get Nebraska to upgrade their internet bandwidth. <laughs> that's going to that's gonna suck up a lot of bandwidth. I'm curious, what, and before we move on, I'm, I'm really curious about this, this piece of it. So I can see the, the dramatic cultural differences and the learning experience that occurred between the students in the Middle East and the students in Nebraska. Did you encounter any major cultural differences and challenges between the students in Oman and the students in UAE? Or was there a lot of similarity? Well, uh, the institution that we partnered with in the UAE, it's very diverse and very cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. um, la large number of their students come from Europe and Asia and so on and so forth. They, of course, had Emirati students, and there were instances that those cultural differences even within their classrooms stood out for us, for those of us who, uh, who were watching um, from, from a distance. Uh, but we could definitely see the difference in classroom setting and organization between Oman and UAE. In Oman, it was much more traditional. Men sat in the front mm -hmm. of the class. All the uh, female students sat in the back of the class. There were very little um, or almost no um, mingling at all compared to that. Um, the UAE classroom looked more boisterous and more diverse. Uh, but that's the whole point mm -hmm. of um, having our students understand that how classrooms function around the world. Interesting. So I'm, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm, I live vicariously through your social media feed, all, all your traveling. Um, talk, talk to me a little bit about, you know, you've brought the world into the classroom in Nebraska, but you've also taken the students from Nebraska out into the world as well. What, what role does study abroad play in, in your mind in the students and how has that played a role in your development as a member of the academy and what has that process been like? Because you've, you've really covered quite dramatically different places in your study abroad travels. I mean, from Ireland to India to Oman, the, these are very different places, and taking students to these places must have presented some unique challenges as well. Oh, absolutely. And, um, you know, I am very, very passionate about experiential learning, and I always uh, ask myself that question that, as an educator, what can I do to provide our students um, some of the best possible learning experiences? And once again, uh, what travel does is that um, it opens your eyes, it, um, it helps you develop perspective about things, that um, how um, food is different from country to country or what are some of the cultural nuances and so on and so forth. So uh, with the study abroad, yes, I mean, taking students, uh, American students to the Middle East is um, not an easy endeavor, but I had tremendous support from um, the university um, so that I am able to do that. And yes, the challenges um, are many, and it comes right from sometimes even the families are not sure that, that, that they, they will let their students travel there. So sometimes I actually have to have a conversation with the parents. What, do you, say? what do you say in that comment? I mean, what are, what are, is it safety? Is it, um, is it a lack of understanding on the part of the parents? Um, what, what is the, I mean, you don't have to divulge private confidential conversations, but I'm, I'm really curious on what the, how that, what the, the, the focus of that conversation is. And there oh, is a concern. Prim primarily safety. Um, and, and, and more so because 80, 85% of the students in our program are female. So especially, um, the narrative that we hear in media in the United States is that, all of these places are extremely dangerous and, and so on and so forth. Yes, there are, uh, there are parts of the Middle East uh, which are not fit for travel uh, with students and so on and so forth. But the places we go, not only we do um, very good due diligence, we have great partners um, in those countries and so on and so forth. So I basically assure the parents that we have um, all of these um, amenities and facilities in place in their student is going to have a very safe travel experience and they're going to learn a lot. 
And, uh, and what I find absolutely fantastic is that by the time we are done um, with the study abroad program, these students are completely changed and it, it creates a hunger in them to travel more. It's a life-changing experience. Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and because of the diversity of the places I take students to, sometimes I will say, you know, the, the United Kingdom or the Ireland is the starting study, study abroad. That's how you get them interested. And maybe then they can graduate to a place like India, and then they can go to a place like the Middle East, you know, on and so on and so forth. And so what has happened is because we have been able to do this multiple times, the study abroads. Now, um, we have a very good traction and track record within the university. So students will come to me asking when this next program is going to go. Um, so I think um, we have done a pretty decent job is cr in creating um, interest among students that, that our study abroads are, are somewhat different and they will really deliver a life-changing experience, whether eating their food or, or visiting houses of worship, which, which are completely different from their own and so on and so forth. Um, but as you rightly said, yes, um, that all of these requires a lot of work, a lot of planning, uh, but it's worth it. Where do you think you see the biggest growth in terms of study abroad going forward? Is it is it the Middle East? Is it certain parts of Asia? Is it? I, I would say, um, of course, um, I see a lot of potential in Asia, especially in some of the countries that traditionally um, American students have not traveled to. For example, I think um, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, that would be a phenomenal destination to explore um, compared to the more well-traveled destinations such as Thailand. Um, China is, of course, um, very important, so is India. And yes, there are places in the Middle East, for example, Oman, which is beautiful, which is safe, and so on and so forth, that can really, really uh, expose American students to a completely different culture and can kind of help them understand the perspectives of the bigger world. Mm -hmm. And all these study abroads that you do, they have a hospitality and tourism focus around them, or they're more culturally focused? When, when you plan them, how, how do you design them? My study abroad are primarily <clears throat> focused on hospitality and tourism, but uh, I have done two programs, which the, basically the university had asked me to put together. They are more interdisciplinary in nature. Mm. For example, I did a study abroad to India, and in that uh, we teamed up with the Department of Textiles, Merchandising, and Fashion Design because India is a big textiles uh, producer. So what we did is we had students from both the hospitality and uh, um, the textiles, merchandising, fashion design majors, and they worked remarkably well. I mean, each had to learn from uh, one another. Um, as a matter of, for example, uh, when I do the study broads, I will take the students to look at some ultra-luxury hotels. And I remember when we were um, getting a property tour of one of the ultra-luxury hotels in India, the textile students were picking up on all of the furnishings and mm -hmm. the lighting. So I'm just saying that... Yeah, it's, a, it's a, not an uncommon partnership. Right. Shout out to our friends at Iowa State. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Um, that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I think the challenge with, um, with study abroad, particularly in a place like India or, or China, is there's just so much to see. And with, with China, you know, you and I have both been traveling to China a lot is how do you do that in 12 days? How do you do it justice? Because, okay, let's say you want to go to China. You want to knock out Beijing. You want to knock out Shanghai. By the time you get over there, that's, that's four or five days you've already done by the time you see all the sites. You've only got a couple more days. You tack on one or two more cities, and, and I'm not sure you've done it justice, that, that there's so much more. If you want to do a deep dive into the country, and one argument says you pick one or two cities and you do a really in-depth look at those where you look at the history and you look at the culture and you, um, or you try to get as, you know, five or six different cities in, but then you have the travel time and India's kind of similar. Um, we do one here where we do Hong Kong, Macau, and Singapore. 
And that's a really aggressive trip, but we do that in 12 days. Hong Kong and, and Macau make sense because they're easy to get to. You just have the ferry. But still, it's, a, it's an exhausting trip to, to do th three countries. It's very aggressive in 12 days to be able to do. A little bit easier in Europe because you have the high-speed rail system. Um, we were talking on a podcast a couple of weeks ago about the the access to high-speed rail, how it just makes things easier to not have to get on a plane and deal with that. Being able to, uh, and I think this is probably going to be a game changer from a study abroad standpoint, is the access to high-speed rail, how much easier and efficient it is to travel in large groups, not having to get there two hours in advance. It goes just as fast. It's just as efficient. You can get into the smaller destinations, not have to worry about the hub and spoke system. Um, like you trying to get here yesterday from Lincoln to Chicago, a high-speed rail, snow wouldn't have affected it. Exactly. And, and since you're talking about high-speed rail, I mean, China has done a remarkable job in expanding their high-speed rail system. I mean, you can now travel from Beijing to Shanghai or in any of these um, using the high-speed rail. Um, so, so, yes, I completely agree with you that transportation logistics takes up so much of your time and also, to answer your question about, you know, how best to plan, um, well, it's kind of a trial and error, as you know it. For example, I have done, f I have done five cities in India during a study abroad, wow. and I very quickly realized that is not a model, especially sometimes we will have students who have not traveled internationally before, and it is exhausting especially if you are having a 10-hour, 12-hour time change, jet lag, all of that stuff. And so now when I actually create these programs, I take all of those things into account in a mm -hmm. sense that uh, give them some decompression time and uh, so that they can enjoy. Otherwise, what's the point if they're falling asleep on the bus mm -hmm. while we are you know, going to see the Taj Mahal or whatever it is sure. that we are trying to do? Yeah. I, don't, I, I sometimes... And it's not necessarily something that the students need to worry about, but I sometimes don't think the students appreciate always the planning that goes on for these trips. I mean, from a faculty perspective, we literally almost have it down to the hour, every waking hour, what we're going to be doing. It's we're getting up, we're going to breakfast from this time to this time. At this time, we're walking to this place. This, then we're going to be here from this point to this point. Then we're going to be walking from this point to this point. This, and then we're going to have lunch. And then every waking hour is planned down to the detail. I mean, we even plan in when free time is, when break times are. I mean, it, it has to get down to that level of granularity uh, because we don't want to exhaust the students. We want them to have a good time. And we have to plan in that free time where they can go shopping and decompress and spend time with their friends, and they meet new friends when they're over there. It's not uncommon to see multiple schools visiting the same place at the exact same time, and um, even within the group of 20 or however many you take that they meet new friends and they want to explore things on their own. And we might pick things that we think the students want to see, but once they get over there, they might identify other things that they want to see, and we want to be able to build in that time for them. Yes, um, at, at University of Nebraska-Lincoln, our planning cycle is 18 months. So if I want to propose a program for, say, um, 2020 spring break, everything has to be submitted by February 15th of 2019 wow. because uh, it takes a lot of time to go through um, the different processes and then make sure that all of the uh, especially the risk and liability and all of those things are, are taken care of. Um, I, I do not know um, in terms of the faculty leader training that you do here at DePaul, uh, but at Nebraska, all faculty leaders leading our education abroad program has to go through a faculty leader certification. Uh, they have to attend four seminars, and they have to be up to speed on everything from title, how to handle title line issues while study abroad to all of the logistics and all those kinds of things so that it is very, very important that faculty is ready and, and able to um, make quick decisions um, if something does happen during one of, the, one of those programs. So it is mandatory. That's great. So on this theme of travel, where have you traveled lately? Let's talk about, let's talk about you. 
and you traveling for fun or you traveling for work, not necessarily with students. I love following you and, as I said, where, where you're traveling. Where have you traveled? What's coming up? Where are you going that's fun? What's on your bucket list? Um, sure. Uh, well, my, uh, my last travel was in January. Um, I was in Cancun, Mexico. Oh, my God. I, it's not a bad place to be with the snow I see coming in the forecast here. Yes, ab- absolutely. And, and one of the reasons I went there is I'm, I'm very much interested um, in, the, in the Mayan civilization, so I always oh. wanted to see... Uh, the Chichen Itza, the, the ancient uh, Mayan city with the temple of the feathered serpent god. So that was an absolute treat for me. I spent a lot of time there and and kind of getting a better understanding, and that has now fueled my desire to visit um, other Mayan or Aztec um, similar um, similar civilizational towns or, or, or these temples in other parts of Latin America. A bucket list you asked, of course, um, both Machu Picchu and Angkor Wat, though these are two two different opposite directions of the world, they're very much um, on my on my bucket list. You shouldn't have any problem hitting your uh, mileage goals then on United. That's correct. <laughs> uh, that, 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 that's correct. Okay. And then as part of my sabbatical, um, I am traveling to a lot of places. Um, in two weeks, I'm, I'm I'm traveling to India, and then coming back. Uh, then I'll be spending the entire month of April in China um, at a university there. And then in May, I'm first going to Ukraine and then through the Netherlands. Then, of course, Hong Kong, where I'll see you at the, at the euro korea PACRI conference. And then um, in June, I'm doing a big curriculum development project for a luxury hotel company in India. So once again, um, that's a part of my learning process. And then my sabbatical is over. Uh, <laughs> So basically a lot of um, air miles coming up. Is it difficult as a hospitality educator to travel? I mean, are you a difficult guest to have in a hotel? I don't know whether I'm a a difficult guest, but I am a pretty picky guest um, in a sense that um, in many of the hotels I stay, I have students working there. And I always tell them that, you know, let me know if you want any feedback. And I give them feedback quietly about simple things like um, like a crooked pillow uh, in, in the living room sofa and, and so on and so forth. But it's, it's, it's all in, in, in good cheer. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I don't think I'm a difficult guest, but, um, but I think I'm a discerning guest. So I really appreciate um, when, whether it's a restaurant or a hotel or any kind of an hospitality establishment does a real good job. I try to reward them by writing a glorious review on TripAdvisor. Um, but, uh, but I do enjoy traveling, I, and I do en- enjoy engaging with the industry. What are some of the trends that you're seeing that we, you know, I think you and I both can agree that the uh, service standards and service level that we see in Western, the Western hotel brands abroad are very, very different. Uh, we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago on uh, the podcast with, uh, I think, Stephen Marks. We were talking about it. A lot of the Western hotel brands, particularly when they open up in Asia, are delivering a very, very different level of service than we might be used to here in the U.S. Why, why do you think that is? I'm, I'm curious on what your perspective is. You're very loyal to Marriott, That's if, correct. I, if I remember correctly. Um, but if you go stay at a full-service Marriott, uh, abroad uh, in, let's say, Beijing, that's very different than one here. Why do you think that might be? Well, one of the reasons is that in many of the, especially the Asian countries or even in the Middle East, um, what, what happens is service is possible because there are lots of people and there is an expectation from the guest, in a sense, to deliver um, a very highly personalized uh, people-driven service. Uh, here in the U.S., we are more of an individual society, so it is not that I am always expecting to someone to carry my bag as soon as I um, get off the get off the Uber um, at the at the Ritz Carlton in Chicago. I'm offered, but I am I, I can always decline. But in India or China, as you know, uh, that's not even an option. Somebody will take your bag and and take it to the room. It's, it's also a concept of that culture in a sense that I 
in relationship oriented societies, um, that's what you do and that's what you expect. Uh, because many times you will see um, that in China or even in Asia, there will be five people standing just to point out directions to the restaurant and so on and so forth. Uh, one, one way of arguing that well is that labor is relatively cheaper, but I think it is also cultural um, that, um, that drives a lot of that. Because I, I hear the opposite side of the story, like for example, someone who has stayed, say, at a Hyatt Regency in India, they're expecting the same kind of service level at a Hyatt Regency here in the United States, and they're almost shocked that um, that they, they do not have that kind of a service experience. Interesting. Do you so talk to me a little bit about? I'm I'm fascinated by what are some of the other trends that you're seeing, maybe in India and the Middle East, from a perspective of the hospitality and tourism industry. I mean, we we kind of know here from a U.S. perspective what are some of the trends that we're seeing and. We've talked about maybe some of the trends here in Chicago, but um, in the, the MENA region of the world, what are some of the trends that you're seeing? Well, there is definitely um, a tremendous growth um, in luxury uh, brands. And, and traditionally in the U.S., when we talk about luxury brands, we talk about very large Western brands such as Rich Carlton or Four Seasons and so on and so forth. Uh, but as you know very well, Asia has some formidable luxury brands, whether it is a peninsula, Mandarin Oriental in India, Oberoi Hotels, Taj. Um, so we are seeing an evolution of what luxury means. Luxury is becoming more global, and the guest is looking at a different kind of luxury, which is more boutique, more intimate, and, and all of that stuff. Also, I'm seeing technology playing a much bigger role. I was um, staying at a hotel in Beijing just in December, and I asked for a bottle of water, and actually the robot concierge came up to my room and delivered that bottle of water. So it's a whole different level of integration, and I think going forward, um, AI and automation is going to have a very different kind of implications on the industry. But for some of those, for some of those brands, those luxury brands, Oberoi, Taj, Jumeirah, uh, in the Middle East, all the technology in the world I don't think is going to be able to replace that human touch. And that's, to me, that's somewhat reassuring, that, that you're always going to have that human experience, which I, which I think is really nice. And from, from our perspective as educators, that's also somewhat reassuring, that there's always going to be a need for... for teachers and and for hospitality education because so much of what we do is teaching those soft skills and teaching people that um, it's not the act of carrying the bag or checking someone in the hotel it's the act of greeting with a smile and it's the things that a robot can't necessarily do that I think makes hospitality great particularly in the luxury segment oh um, a absolutely. Yeah. Um, in the luxury segment, there there continues to be a tremendous demand um, for that authentic employee. Yeah. So, final final thought here before we kind of wrap up: what what keeps you motivated? What keeps you excited? What keeps you going? I think um, the joy of seeing our students coming in as freshmen, and then how they transform through the college experience, and then they be become friends and colleagues in the industry, doing amazing things. I mean, that is. It's just incredible. And the fact that we or I can play a small part in that journey is, is, is what keeps me motivated. I mean, this is just incredible what we do. It's the hospitality spirit, as they say. Well, Deep Road, thank you so much for being here. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to, to spending some time with you while you're on your sabbatical here at DePaul. And uh, uh, you're going to be quite engaged with us here over the over your visit. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff, great stuff planned for you. I hope we can um, show you all the cool things that we do from an academic standpoint, from a co-curricular standpoint. Uh, I'm excited that you're going to be able to engage some of our students, uh, engage with some of our faculty here, and uh, can show you around Chicago a little bit. And uh, again, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you, Nick. It's so recorded live at the corner of State and Jackson. I'm Dr. Nicholas Thomas. This has been the Hospitality Spirit. Thanks so much for listening.